I hope we had a very good lunch. Now we continue our session after lunch, which is all about indigenous knowledge. Um, as you know, we started just behind, before we break for lunch. We covered a little bit uh, indigenous issues in relationship to climate change. Now we'd move to the practical aspect of indi indigenous issues, uh, the real experience. So um, that is the purpose of this afternoon session is just to introduce a concept of knowledge and provide some um, examples of what it means in practice. And we'll cover a little bit um, how, how the concept of indigenous knowledge is covered, like in the SDGs, in the International uh, United Nations, and the Convention on Biological Diversity. Also, we will have some few cases from Thailand, if time will permit, also from my own country, Tanzania. So um, I will moderate this session. My name is Michael Marabeja from Tanzania. And um, we have three, as you can see, we have uh, three presenters. The first one be Professor Florian Stamler. Then we will have Clement, who will do an interview. He will have some presentation. Oh, yeah, Clement is here. My very good friend Clement is here. And uh, he will do some few slides, and then he will have interview. And, um, and later on, we will have Olivia through video, and he will join us online. Um, So as we go on, as the way used in, we, we did it in the morning, if you have any question and contribution, do it th through the Slido. During plenary discussion, we'll get your contribution. So uh, our first speaker will be Professor Stamler, Florian Stamler. Uh, this is a professor from the University of Lapland Arctic Center here in Rovaniemi. Um, he has done a lot of work in, in, the, in the indigenous um, concept, so to speak. And um, he has led the Finnish International Research Project and published extensively in Arctic Human, Social, and Cultural Diversity, and um, here and international. One of the, his key topics is the relationship between humans and the environment in the Arctic. So Professor Stamler is a very, very well-known expert here, and uh, even in the Russian Arctic where he has lived for, um, for years. So at this particular time, I would want to invite Professor Stamler to come and address. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. Um, it's an honor to be here and introduce you in this presentation to the concept of indigenous knowledge or indigenous ways of knowing, I would, how I would like to prefer to call it, and introduce you to some of the ways in which uh, these ways of knowing can be useful, not only for the sake of preserving indigenous cultures on our planet, but also for the development of humankind in general. Because these are ways of knowing and relating to the world from which everyone, not just indigenous residents, uh, can benefit. Um, these ways of knowing are good for 
for the entire planet, I would guess. Um, in the following, you will see a lot of photographs in my presentation where you can see people, and just to get the ethics right, they all have given our, their consent to be on these photos in public presentations. But I would kindly like to ask you not to post these photos on the internet, because for that we do not have consent. So I hope you understand that. Um, do we have a pointer that where I can change the slides? Is it this one? The black one is the main Oh, the black one. OK, great, good. So, um, so some basics about indigenous knowledge. There's a lot of misconceptions. And um, I, I want to emphasize that, as an anthropologist, I do not speak on behalf of indigenous people, um, because they are much better on doing that for themselves. Um, but I speak about the concepts and the, uh, the, the general typologies of ways of knowing that we have in our world and how indigenous ways of knowing may compare to what we call uh, scientific ways of knowing, although I do not think that this is a very um, successful categorization um, because it marginalizes the indigenous ways as, as if there would be no science. Um, but, uh, but here on the slides, uh, you see some of these, some of these conceptions, and, and I would like to emphasize that indigenous ways of knowing um, what they are not and what they are. Um, and I think there is a lot of benefit that we can gain from understanding uh, the specifics of these indigenous ways of knowing. Um, so first of all, a lot of these ways of knowing, they are uh, personal and they are subjective. And in science, we are used to sort of marginalizing any kind of knowledge that is not replicable and objective as if it was not valid. And I think there we get something fundamentally wrong because what actually matters for people on this planet is not only the facts, but also the interpretation of the facts and what they do with these facts and how do they implement the consequences of knowing about these facts in their real lives. And all of this context is what we get with indigenous ways of knowing because they're always context sensitive, um, because they are born out of experience. Um, they are passed down from the generations of the ancestors to the current generation, and they will pass them on um, if the culture and the culturally specific livelihoods are not destroyed uh, to their children and grandchildren. And in this way, um, they implement these ways of knowing every time they go out on the land. And for example, as uh, they do in this part of the world, um, herd reindeer on pastures. Um, so these ways of knowing are experience-based. And in that way, they are empirically checked over and over again in real life situations. And that's very different from a sort of scientific, uh, what we call a scientific uh, knowledge that is designed in labs, in experiments that are far detached from real life situations. So there's always a challenge on how this scientific knowledge can actually be applied and be made useful um, for people who live in a specific areas. Now, this problem doesn't exist with indigenous ways of knowing um, because they live on the land anyway, and they test this knowledge um, without purposefully doing so uh, in their real life from day to day. Um, and so as a result, what we get is um, a way of knowing the environment as um, what one classical anthropologist, uh, Marcel Mauss from France, has called a fait total social, the environment as a total social fact. And that includes everything that people can observe on the land and what generations of ancestors has passed on to them and what they will pass on to their next generations of their children and grandchildren. And this is um, not restricted to what we call nature. This is also the ways of knowing what, for example, infrastructure built by humans mean for living with the environment. And all of these ways of knowing, they base on an idea where all the beings in the environment are interrelated. As we see here on this picture from uh, Siberia, from my field in Yakutia, for example, uh, there is a very tangible relation between the horse and the reindeer. Um, the reindeer is tied to the tail of the horse. 
um, because they use both reindeer and horses in reindeer herding. And that is, of course, interconnected with the land. So this relational knowledge, this relational way of knowing among indigenous people includes all the different components. So it does not compartmentalize the vegetation in one experiment, the horse in the, in the next experiment, the reindeer in the third experiment, and the mountain and the air and the permafrost in the fifth and fourth and sixth element experiment. It's all interconnected. And that what, that's what makes it so valuable for real life interpretations. And these ways of knowing also include um, not only the, ter the terrestrial, but also the water environment, um, as you can see here on this picture from salmon fishery in Kamchatka. Um, so knowing the land um, among indigenous peoples is very much connected, obviously, in many of these cultures that we know among indigenous peoples for living with animals. This is about how to make the optimal use of the animal in a partnership with the animal together, which also includes, obviously, and finally eating the animal, as you can see here on this photo uh, from my field site with friends in the Yamal Peninsula in Russia. It also includes a very expressed way of knowing the different seasons, um, which makes all the difference, obviously, even more so in an environment such as the Arctic, where the difference between the seasons are so expressed. For example, in this place in Yakutia, the temperatures go down to minus 60 degrees centigrade in winter and plus 30 degrees in summer. So obviously it makes a huge difference what you know from the environment um, between those seasons. And this knowledge obviously also includes the seasonality of the animals. Like you see here, the salmon on the way from the Pacific Ocean um, to the rivers uh, where the indigenous fishermen harvest them in competition with biggest, bigger fisher industries that you see here in, in the background. And it also includes these ways of knowing, the knowing of the spiritual aspects of people's relation to the land. Because in many of the indigenous cosmologies, um, the surrounding environment is alive. And animals have souls just as people have and water bodies and plants and mountains um, have also souls and some of them are worshipped on sacred sites as you see here where we work together with um, this friend of mine, the reindeer herder, to save the sacred site from um, a road construction that was built by the Gazprom gas company which you see here on the background. So you can actually see that the road makes a little turn and this is part of the work that we did together with the reindeer herders, how we documented um, ways of knowing sacred sites, which uh, fortunately induced the company to build the road around the sacred site. So these are practical applications of indigenous ways of knowing. And I think it's important to emphasize here uh, that we should not think that um, these, ways, these are ways of knowing that are sort of petrified in traditions like in a museum. And these are perfectly adaptable and adapted to um, a belief in modern technology as well. Um, with digital technologies including, you can see here that in what is called traditional livelihoods, there are all kinds of modern tools in applicants. For example, here, Chokcha, this friend of mine, the reindeer herder, he, I don't know anybody else who can so skillfully use a motor saw for cutting wood for building ranger sledges, which you see here on the background. Because that involves, for example, knowing from which side this particular tree has got the sunshine, because the texture of the wood is different on different sides of the tree. So you need to work with the motor saw in order to cut the tree in the right way to get your sledge runner with the maximum hardness. Um, just to show you that this, this does not mean that people are sort of technologically averse. Um, they, have, uh, they include their indigenous ways of knowing um, also in their, in their life together with satellite dishes and uh, watching, watching movies and blockbusters in a nomadic tent um, so that children of all, generation, um, all generations together with their grandfathers uh, are exposed to all of that, and that does not mean that traditional knowledge hasn't got a place in such a world anymore. 
Or you can see here how, um, how they use modern machines to release reindeer from mosquito harassment in the summer, just in the way we use here in the Arctic um, mosquito repellent to protect ourselves. So why shouldn't the reindeer also enjoy some of this welfare? And uh, they use the machines uh, running on petrol for that. Um, so just uh, to, before I finish up, I give you some practical examples of how this ways of knowing can be um, applied. For example, you see here, this was a pipeline project that is called the Power of Siberia that transports Siberian gas to China. Um, and um, indigenous knowledge would have been very useful in terms of um, knowing where the permafrost has which texture because in response to that, uh, they would have chosen sites um, where the pipeline can run in a more stable way and would not drown from a melting permafrost. Unfortunately, that wasn't very well realized in this particular example. Um, in Yamal here in West Siberia, it worked a little bit better. That was the same example that you saw on the previous uh, slide with the sacred site, uh, where they actually did, for example, raise pipelines in order to give reindeer the possibility to, mi to migrate through under these pipelines, as you can see here on this picture. Um, practical relevance from indigenous ways of knowing also includes obviously knowing the biodiversity in the water, at which season you can catch which fish in order to give to your children the most healthy food. Um, here in this case, it's a red fish dried um, on the back of a nomadic camp. And it also includes, obviously, knowledge of not only the plants uh, that you can see, but also the plants that are buried under the snow. Because in the Arctic, it's as important to know um, what happens in the summer than what happens uh, in the winter. Be because most of, um, or half of the year, the vegetation is covered by snow. So these reindeer herders actually know, like here, Jura um, in Yamal, what grows under the snow and how good is that a food for the reindeer. Um, so at any point they can dig down and check the land if this is a suitable pasture for the reindeer. Um, and therefore um, there are many possibilities to actually employ indigenous ways of knowing also in what we maybe call mainstream industries. For example here this um, Evenki friend is um, explaining to my colleague Italina Ivanova how um, the mining company should, should uh, isolate their tailings from their gold mining in order to preserve the land for continued use by reindeer herders. Um, because what's actually left over when gold companies leave is land like this, which is not much use for reindeer herding anymore, and hence indigenous ways of knowing and biodiversity and cultural diversity would be in danger. Um, in that way, I would uh, strongly, strongly advocate also for inclusion of uh, indigenous expertise in what we call social and cultural impact assessments. When we have um, industry projects advancing into lands that, um, that are occupied with indigenous cultures and livelihoods. As you see here, they, they can navigate um, with their reindeer through mining sites, um, but they need to be allowed to do so um, and employ their indigenous ways of knowing the land um, in due time. Um, <clears throat> they can also be very well um, applied in uh, designing codes of conduct how workers of industrial companies should behave when they get to indigenous lands, for example, um, which is what we did in a joint project uh, with my colleague Bruce Forbes and many reindeer herders from Yamal and also from here. Um, we um, designed guidelines, uh, a code of conduct of how um, gas industry workers should behave in these areas where there is a nomadic livelihood. Um, and um, I'm happy to say that this actually, before Russia started its war in Ukraine, was quite successful as it made it into the Gazprom social uh, sustainability policy, and it was also discussed in the Russian parliament. Um, <clears throat> Obviously, indigenous ways of knowing can also be used as uh, inciting measures when a company or a government decide which areas to use for industrial exploration. So that something like that, which you see here, does not happen, where you have uh, 
the land turned into a moon landscape just next to a nomadic reindeer herders camp, which you see in the background. Um, <clears throat> and um, in my last minute, um, I want to emphasize that working with indigenous ways of knowing actually works best um, if we leave behind all our understandings of hierarchies, if there is an equal partnership uh, where we work on equal terms with our partners and integrate them into the entire life cycle of the projects that we have. And that also includes not only free prior informed consent, but actually full participation by the people, also in the design of the projects that we want to carry through. <clears throat> and that also includes uh, spending a lot of time drinking tea with people, um, because um, the perception of time uh, among many of our partners who live in much closer relation to the natural environment than we do uh, is very different from us. Um, there it doesn't work to give people like one minute more to talk. <laughs> you need to have time for a month <laughs> to understand what they're up to. And with this I finish and I thank you very much for your attention and I would like to acknowledge that um, what I analyzed here all bases on the wisdom of the indigenous friends and partners that I have worked with in the last 20 years. Thank you. Wow. wow. This was very, very informative, isn't it? Very, very informative. Yeah, and um, it's an eye-opener for we, most of us, we are auditors. There's a lot of take-home thing from here. And um, like during the planning uh, time to understand the process, not instead of jumping to collect data, to understand the process and the, especially the, on the way of knowing. And um, we were advised us to include uh, the expert in these areas as we plan for our audit as well. So um, this is a, a very, very uh, important, and we will have time for discussion later on. And um, the second uh, presenter is, um, it will be based on the video, is um, Mr. Oliver uh, Lukundo. Oliver Lukundo is uh, from the um, Secretariat of the Convention of the Biological Diversity. And um, there, he oversees all matters related to traditional knowledge, innovations, practices, and uh, those with related to provision, gender, biodiversity, etc. And um, before that, he worked with FAO and UNDP and GIZ. So um, he's a very experienced in this area. So he'll come through video, but he'll be online during the plenary session. So if you can ask question direct after during the plenary session. At this time, I would like to welcome all of us to follow Olivia through the video. Yes, hello, good afternoon. Uh, today I'm gonna be sort of addressing you in regards to the work on the convention on Article AJ and related provisions and basically all the work that we do at the convention as regards to uh, indigenous people and local communities and issues related to traditional knowledge. My name is Olivia Rukundo. I'm the head of the Peoples and Biodiversity Unit at the CBD Secretariat. So in terms of introduction, I will share my screen and then we can sort of start with regards to uh, the presentation itself, uh, where I'll be highlighting a few uh, things with regards to the CBD itself, the broader related issues, but of course the focus will be on the, um, on the convention on biological diversity, on particularly on issue that relates to traditional knowledge and uh, indigenous people and local communities. So in terms of a background, the Convention on Biological Diversity was um, uh, adopted uh, in Rio in 1992, and it's one of the, during the Rio Earth Summit. 
In the Convention on Biological Diversity, the importance of indigenous and local communities was uh, acknowledged quite quickly. Uh, governments acknowledged that the close dependency of many indigenous people and local communities as regards to biological resources and the need to also uh, ensure that there's a sharing of benefits associated with the use of traditional knowledge, innovation and practices relevant to the conservation of biological diversity and the sustainable use of its component. Here, the first thing to note is that the actual convention talks about traditional knowledge, innovation and practices, uh, which is important because this is actually broad and encompasses all the traditional knowledge and uh, practices and other applications of such that are actually under the helm and the control of indigenous people and local communities. The Article 8J on the CBD uh, provides that uh, subject to its national legislation, uh, parties have to respect, preserve and maintain knowledge, innovation of practices of indigenous people and local communities, and also this idea of seeking always the approval and involvement of the holders of such knowledge before using it, and also encouraging, of course, the, the, the benefit sharing arising from the use of uh, the utilization of traditional knowledge. So what are the objectives related to traditional knowledge according to the CBD? It's the conservation of biological diversity, the sustainable use of its component, and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the use of genetic resources, which is also associated with the Dagoya protocol, which we will talk about in a minute. In terms of the uh, paragraph article 8J, it talks about respect, preserve and maintain traditional knowledge of indigenous uh, people and local communities and promote its wider application within the approval and involvement of the holder of such knowledge. And of course, as said before, it uh, encourages benefit sharing arising from the use of such knowledge. Now, with regards to the processes, uh, or participatory processes mechanism of IPLCs uh, under the CBD, um, the CBD has uh, a history of making sure that indigenous people and local communities participate in the in the process. So we have a uh, within the pe Peoples and Biodiversity Unit, we have three staff and one staff dedicated particularly to traditional knowledge um, and who is also representative of the Indigenous uh, community. Um, and then we have, uh, of course, a close liaison with the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity. Uh, we have a traditional knowledge information portal. And of course, the main uh, policy process uh, structure in which decisions are made with regards to traditional knowledge relates to the ad hoc open-ended working group on Article AJ. Um, and we also facilitate registration of the CBD meetings and we accompany Indigenous people and local communities to ensure that effective participation in not only in the meetings of the working group on Article AJ, but also on other uh, meetings and processes in the CBD, and we also have a voluntary funding mechanism that also supports the participation uh, of Indigenous people and local communities to our meetings. And of course, we undertake a series of in, uh, capacity building and capacity development as regards to uh, Indigenous people and local communities. So uh, we are now on the third iteration of the program of work on traditional knowledge. And uh, there's been a number of tools uh, that have been developed. Um, you will see here on the screen some voluntary guidelines that have been developed um, on this particular subject. Um, and this relates to actually the work that has been done um, as regards to sort of having some guidelines to sort of speak to certain issues that are relevant to the implementation of Article AJ. We notably have a plan of action on, on, on the customary sustainable use of biological diversity and other tools and key concepts, and uh, including a glossary of terms that are quite useful for uh, the implementation of uh, Article AJ. Of course, there are other mechanisms under the convention that speaks also to the interest of indigenous people and local communities. There's the Nagoya Protocol, which was adopted in 2010. Um, and the Nagoya Protocol speaks uh, in a more circumscribed way about traditional knowledge, and it speaks about traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources. And um, it actually sort of provides for the recognition, again, of traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources as regards to benefit sharing, as regards to the involvement and uh, prior informed consent of indigenous people and local communities 
when accessing their traditional knowledge, but also when accessing genetic resources on which uh, or upon which indigenous people and local community have a right on. We of course, have the Karina protocol also, uh, which also speaks to, uh, it's another protocol that also has provisions with regards to indigenous people and local communities, but the most prominent instrument with regards to that would be indeed the Nagoya protocol. So as you all know, very recently there was a, a sort of a global biodiversity framework that was adopted. It's called the Kumin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Uh, the framework was adopted at COP15, which was in last December, and its aim is to halt and reverse biodiversity loss through urgent and transformative action. Uh, the framework's aligns, of course, with the objective of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and it's intended to provide support with regards to the implementation of the convention. It has four long-term goals for 2050 related to the 2050 vision for biodiversity, 23 action-oriented global targets for urgent action over the decade to 2030. Um, in terms of the, the targets, they can sort of be grouped or clustered in the following way. We have uh, a set of targets, target one to eight, that speaks about reducing threats to biodiversity, um, target 9 and 13, which is on meeting people's needs through sustainable use and benefit sharing. And then you have tools and solutions for the implementation and mainstreaming, which are clustered under targets 14 to 23. And you have a set of goals, goal, uh, and the one that actually sort of speaks to um, uh, indigenous and indigenous people and local communities. Uh, you'll see that it's featured in goal C. Uh, but also uh, you'll see that goal A has a reference to also safeguarding uh, sort of uh, 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 the ad an adaptive potential um, and safeguarding the rights of population over genetic diversity. And of course, goal D, which is a more financial related goal. But again, what is important to note here is that um, the issue of indigenous people and uh, local communities is well featured in the uh, global biodiversity framework. So this is goal C again, which is basically the goal that relates to the benefit sharing. So it links to, of course, the Nagoya protocol that I've presented before, but also has, of course, element related to traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources. And that's quite important to note. Now, what is really, really key here with regards to uh, the Cumin, uh, the the, Mont uh, the Cumin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework is that it has a cross-cutting uh, section, section C, and there there is really um, strong language and strong references to the rights of indigenous people and local community, the recognition of different value system, the right to clean and healthy and sustainable environment. You'll see here that we are sort of uh, lining up with the uh, sustainable development goal. There is the also this idea of promoting a human rights-based approach, which is really linked to, um, to, to the interest and, uh, of course, the, the rights of indigenous people and local community, of course, gender equality, intergenerational equi equity with regards to youth, and very, very important, the framework is a whole of government and whole of society approach. So it's not just a framework for parties, uh, it has to really, in terms of its implementation, it has to cut across all the stakeholders and it has to sort of take into account all the rights of all involved in terms of the uh, conservation, sustainable use of biological diversity. So that includes all stakeholders, but also most importantly, indigenous people and local communities. I must note that um, the adoption of the framework uh, was a great success for indigenous people and local communities. Uh, representatives who are very involved in the negotiation of the framework. And uh, uh, what has been achieved is that uh, the rights of indigenous uh, people and local communities is really well recognized in the framework. And actually it's a prominent feature of the framework, which is really a good step ahead. Of course, we have a dedicated target, if you will, that talks about uh, uh, indigenous people and local communities, um, and that has very strong language, uh, into including uh, uh, language on uh, equitable, inclusive, effective, and gender responsive representation uh, in decision making of indigenous people and local community, the respect of their culture, their rights over land, territorial resources, and traditional knowledge, 
as well as uh, women and girls, children and youth. So also the intergenerational gender uh, aspects, and then also uh, ensuring that people with disability uh, are also sort of recognized and very important, uh, the recognition in the framework of the rights of environmental human rights defender. So that's target 22, which is quite important for the purposes of implementing um, Article AJ uh, and in as regards to the work on traditional knowledge. Of course, we have the monitoring framework also, uh, which is actually sort of meant to is under development negotiations or if you will, refinement on the monitoring framework on the way. We have some headline indicator, binary indicator, uh, component indicators, and of course, as we'll see uh, very shortly, we have also indicators that relate to indigenous people and local communities and traditional knowledge. And of course, all of this uh, will be sort of, uh, 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 in terms of implementation, our parties will have, uh, countries will have to set national targets, which the vehicle for that is the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, policy and actions on the ground. Uh, they have to report to the COP to monitor progress. And all of this has to be sort of done uh, in terms of supporting the implementation of the framework. And so there's a need to align the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan with the GBF, um, including the development of national target by COP16, which is gonna happen this year in October. And each COP uh, until 2023 will provide an opportunity for the review of the implementation of the GBF. And of course, there are some mechanism, funding mechanism, um, and uh, such as the GEF. Uh, and uh, recently, there was also a global biodiversity uh, framework fund that was established and ratified by the GEF assembly. And this provides also means upon which implementation can be supported. And of course, uh, the framework being a whole society, whole government uh, uh, approach uh, needs to also align with other instruments and um, uh, including uh, those under UNEP, UNEA 6, for example, which is forthcoming. And there's, of course, a few review mechanism and elements uh, that uh, you are seeing here. Those are some of the steps that will need to be uh, taken as regards to the review of the framework. Now, just to end the presentation, a uh, quick glimpse at what has happened recently with regards to the to, uh, the 12th meeting of the working group on Article Age and related provision took place uh, from the 12th to the 16th in November 2023 in Geneva. Um, here you have uh, a picture of uh, a traditional knowledge um, sort of holder uh, and uh, Mr. Kenneth uh, Deer from the Kanawaki. Mohawk territory who gave the opening um, and it was uh, uh, the, the working group was chaired by Ch China, which is the president and the representative of indigenous uh, uh, people, which is uh, co-chair Ms. June uh, Rubis from Asia. So, and then in terms of the, the working mechanism of the working group uh, in its meeting, uh, we have uh, six representatives from indigenous people and local communities who participate as friends uh, of the Bureau in Bureau meeting, uh, representing the interest of indigenous people and local communities in all the geocultural regions recognized by the UN United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. So very quickly, the, the, the main uh, issue under consideration under Article AJ was the development of a new program of work since we have now completed the task under the old program of work and other provisions. Um, and then as well as discussing institutional arrangements uh, for the implementation of this program of work. So there were some options that were sort of presented in an, uh, an expert group, in an ad hoc uh, uh, technical expert group. Um, and uh, the options were to continue as is, if you will, um, to integrate more the work of the Article DJ in other subsidiary body of the CBD, such as C uh, Substan SBI, um, or to sort of create a stand, uh, standalone subsidiary body, permanent subsidiary body on uh, Article AJ and related provisions. Um, so this work is still um, uh, under development. Uh, uh, there was the, a, a strong uh, push and strong among uh, people, differ, diverging views on, on sort of what would be the best, the new program of work, uh, will be sort of submitted to COP16 for finalization. 
and the modus operandi. There are some views uh, the, that can be basically grouped as follow those who favor uh, a permanent body, uh, those who basically favor a more integrated approach with other processes in the convention, and uh, uh, those who have different views as to sort of what would be the implication, notably budget implications, that need further clarification. So this issue will still be taken up at COP16. The other recommendation um, listed here, the joint program of work on the links between biological diversity and cultural diversity, uh, which actually is um, relates to what I referred to before as the monitoring framework, which uh, relates to the review and update of four traditional uh, uh, traditional knowledge indicators, and uh, this process will be going on. There is a, an updated draft knowledge management com component of the Coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, and also recommendation of, from the International Forum on Biological Diversity uh, on Indigenous issues um, pertaining to the conventions was also sort of discussed. Uh, this text remains also bracketed and it will be the subject for further discussions. And the main issue here is really the distinctions or sort of the uh, recognition of the rights of Indigenous people versus uh, local communities. So there are diverging views among regions on these issues. And um, what we're trying to do now is to facilitate dialogues to ensure that these issues will be sort of taken up in a more smooth and progressive and constructive manner at COP16. And of course, there was an in-depth dialogue which um, was decided for the next section, which, as you see here, relates to uh, financial uh, resource mobilization and access to funding for uh, Indigenous people and local communities, which is a crucial uh, theme under uh, consideration. So I'd like to end here by thanking you again for providing us the opportunity to present um, uh, very briefly the work of the convention and to actually sort of uh, focus on Article AJ. Um, and we really do thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you so much, Olivia. That was very good uh, presentation. And Olivia is still online. You, if you have a question later on, you can ask direct to him. And uh, he has uh, brought a lot of things for us auditors, the source of criteria and for our audit, and we can be prepared, prepared. We can test our size, preparedness to do what is going on concerning the individual, I mean, ind indigenous knowledge. Uh, we, without wasting much of the time, uh, now I would like to introduce our next uh, speaker, who is uh, Dr. Clement. I don't uh, mention the second name, uh, Clement. <laughs> yeah, so Dr. Clement is a postdoctoral researcher in the University of Oulu. He's a cultural anthropogenist. Also, he's a chair of the recent established Sami Climate Council. So he will do two things. He has a short presentation first, and second, he will do an interview he will interview Aunt Ola, who is a reindeer header and a holder of indigenous knowledge in the member of Sami Climate Council. So let me first invite Clement to do the presentation. Welcome. Yeah, maybe you do first the presentation, later interview. <clears throat> Good afternoon to you all. Respect chair, dear panelists and audience. I will start our presentation by saying a few words on Sami Climate Council. Sami Climate Council is an independent scientific organ nominated by Finnish government. Half of the members are, mem are members of the academia and half are holders of Sami traditional knowledge. 
Its main task is to produce knowledge on climate change and its effects to Sami culture. This knowledge will be used in drafting climate action and policies. The aim of the Council is to have a real impact on the climate policy. Climate change is considered as the biggest human right threat, especially to indigenous people. Currently, there are no concrete climate mitigation and adaptation plans concerning Sami people. There is a real need that the Sami Climate Council will succeed in its work. If we succeed, it could be a global model to implement indigenous participatory rights in climate work, but it requires resources. The Sami Climate Council was established because there is not enough knowledge on how climate change and adaptation measures affect Sami culture and status of Sami as indigenous people. It was based on the proposal of research project called Sami and sub supported by Sami stakeholders and traditional knowledge holders. holders. Sami Climate Council also contributes partly to the implementation of Finland's international obligation, like Paris, Paris Climate Convention and Central Human Rights Conventions. Uh, Ante Ola Jusa and I are members of the Sami Climate Council. I'm a representative of the scientific community and Anteola represents the holders of the traditional Sami knowledge. We intend to discuss climate change and specifically Anteola's climate change observations. We discuss in North Sami. There is a couple of reasons for it. It's a really too important to include elders that have extensive knowledge on climate change and traditional knowledge in the climate discussion. This requires that they can use language they prefer. It's also important to remember that climate change has lingual and cultural effects. And the third reason is we have never talked with each other in Finnish or English. It would, be, it would have been strange. So now I will start our discussion with Antti Oula. I have a little bit uh, help uh, to translate it in English. Ja vuosittain katsojalta lää takkar, mä spatsosa, millä slaavi vuotsin jäädä nuppi, vuotsosa, millä tsukko tei vaasu. Mä kar kuohtuun lää. No, tie lekan tuo takkar jäädä. Mä laavi huitaavia jäädä. Aatte talkan tajan, aatte ipahtan tämänkin jäki huipporre kuohtuun. Aatte... Tämä ei kärkän kalamatta heänä, ja nyhoitako puhutin mua. Ja tämän annan sivuaan, että tämä ei pahtan rekta purre kohtuun. Joo, tämä on sellainen asia. Joo, eikö ole tulkkaa se kyllä? Yeah, the first, first yeah. question. Yeah, like the first question uh, when you meet a, a Sami reindeer herder is like... Uh, like when when meeting another another like how's the mine meaning like what is the condition of pasture what is uh the situation with lichen which is the thing that uh reindeers eat lichen i hope it's the correct like lichen lichen oh dear yeah let's do it as a collaborative work yeah <laughs> and 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 situation with uh, snow in general mm. uh, Tämä on tosiaankin kysymys, jota on, on tavattu kysyä hyvinkin usein. Ja 
Ja, ja toki se on tärkeä kysymys. Ja e, tällä, tänä vuonna se, se tuota, tuli, tuli, tai niin kuin jäätyi maa ennen kuin ehti tulla pakkas, että se niin kuin pilasi sen pohjan. Ja, 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 Tämä kai se on se, juuri se kaikkein tärkein oleellinen asia tässä. So this is indeed the question that is always asked when these people meet. And this year was quite unique. So um, the, the, the ground was actually frozen before the snow was in there. So that, that kind of like ruined the, 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 con, um, the conditions uh, for the, the reindeers. Da varten taas alla siitä, jahki ilä jaki velja. Tänkä alkaa pitää pizzaa mille. Niin hän haluaa tässä vielä lisätä sen, että teidän pitää muistaa se, että vuosi ei ole vuoden veli. Että sen, se teidän tulee muistaa. So uh, he wanted to remind us that we need to remember that uh, each year is not... Uh, the same every every year and he used the term uh, each year is not a brother to the other and he also wanted to know has anyone heard this saying that the year is not a brother like a related brother oh yes a few have no montal nyuihken taas kolma Katjalta. Hyppään tässä kolmanteen kysymykseen. Okay. Joo, on lä- Elina, Elinakin kehtarua tässä saamis. Moh kehtara, kehtarua tässä tehdään autsas ja auri luontuu ja talkaa tällä reutan tuu Elinakin aikki. Mä katta, tiedätkö, kun mä muistan tämän nuorra vuotta aikki. Aika tärraajis, mulla on kuhtalokin jaki. Patsalas lemas pochotolus melte ja len vaasi han että ko esken että sen jahkiille jaki velja ahteda molosasi ja molosasit mutta alle te kuokte manni mutta ko dan talvi palaan vuhon apa podi heju talvi ahte ja uti jahki mi mi sattaime pemmat atielet manka palu Mai tänne palaan, missä tät pahtemaan on jo alkahi piemmat. Ate otsu tätä tie auttijaki, kuokten tuhaa oktan blokka, eli nupuri jahki mietarpan, otan kirra te neljä maanu, kolma neljä maanu alki piemmat. Ja teille, otsu me, teille voi jahki kautsi, loki kautsi tälle, Lei meikä nouporre jahkina, ei tarpaan oba piamma. Mutta ei ole täällä mannimusjaki leomassaan, että kuokte tuhaa, kuokte lokiin ja kuokte akta, täällä ei ole erinomassa eistä. So the question, question was like you've lived uh, all your life in the upper, uppermost uh, west, uh, northwestern part of part of Finland, mm. and how has the nature and climate changed in your lifetime? Ja Antti Oula vastaa, että, että to, tosiaankin hän on 60 vuotta ollut poronhoidossa mukana, ja on tosiaankin nähnyt monenlaisia olosuhteita ja vuosia, ja ja muistaa e, muutamat hyvät vuodet, e, 2011 ja, ja, ja sitten sitä ennen 1988, ne oli hyvät vuodet. Mutta sitten nämä 2000-luvulla sitten on ollut nämä huonot vuodet, jossa on, jossa on ollut tuota jäätymistä ja, ja, ja sitten se, se laitunolosuhteet on ollut huonot. So yes, um, Antti Olajuuso has been herding the reindeers um, over 60 years now. And uh, he can uh, remember uh, two very good years, which were uh, 1988 and the other one 2011. 
but uh, especially coming to the um, 21st century, the years have been very challenging for herding the, the reindeers. Ja heillä, heidän piti aloittaa sitten se ruokkiminen, että siis keinoruokinta. So this has actually um, uh, caused that the, they need to give um, additional food. They need to start feeding the reindeer. So there's not enough as, uh, like natural food or Joo. it's very hard to get because of the, the conditions. Ja sitten neljänteen kysymykseen. Mutta tuon talkkaalla reutan läväihkuhan tuun ja viin poltsoparikkuja. Kalta läväihkua nau Paulu. Muuten kai tämän merkkä sanoa, että tämän miisi jääkilke satta saa nou maihla outan satta. Tällä tuhat ei tietää tuoli, tällä lämmä sihan nupuri ja kiit. Tällä kun mun matta raitsalla Ja te muistan tarajis tuo uhti tuoli tietsaloki ja kauhtsiloki. Tällä vel sattai kirsa ennami ja oli mettara assuola. Tällä sattai jääkil, kun on huolilaka otsui nyoskasvuola. Kun jääkä oli sille nuonaista maatta. Tämä tarpaa puolilakaa joskasvuolla. Ja se on minulle luomainen näin. Ahti palsaa kahteen. Ja le, kun lopille hienjälen palsain, ei saatta luomainake teitä palsaajia. Saatte tuossa jääkkerautta ja koko ajan joskas. Ahti ennen taahuus, kun minä olen fosken, että pohjumaksi pillistä tämän jääkkeen mutta hiilä tuota, kun hiilä kirsa ja koi, nu pahka tappe, tai haikki lämmäsän, paitsi kolmella kraatalla puu, tuota liekkas. No, eikä arve. Tämä on tehtä, jos on kuolla lomstarlihti, ne pöytten ala, ottaa vahkuulähki, katsotaan jaamaan. Ja se ammalle jääkin näin, tai jaamaa, kun iät on joskus vuodella. So the question yeah, was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. question was, how has climate change affected you and reindeer herding? Joo, tässä oli vähän pitempi vastaus. Olisin me saattanut suomeksikin siinä katsotaan. Ennen tosiaan oli, silloin kun hänen esi-isänsä oli harjoittamassa poronhoitoa, niin todella oli hyvä... Hyvä tilanne ja, ja, ja tuota, se, hänen mukaansa se on yksi iso syy on ollut siihen jäkälän hyvään kasvuun ja myös muiden kasvien kasvuun, että silloin on ollut, on, tuli routa ja, ja, ja se, se tuota, aiheutti sen, että jäkälä sai altapäin kosketeutta ja ravintoa, samoin kuin, samoin kuin hilla ja tuota, sitten se siihen vähän kriittisesti arvioi sitä, miten tutkijat sanovat, että ei ole, ei ole tätä jäkälää ja ei ole, mutta se, se johtuu juuri tästä, tästä seikasta, että, että tuo toi, niin palsat ja tuo routa on, ne on sulanut. So yes, so um, Antti Ola Jusa said that the generations before him said that the conditions were very, very good. But uh, especially now, the challenge is that um, this lichen, um, previously it, it got, the, it was moistured from the ground because the, the ground was frozen. Uh, there was this, uh, the frost. And he also uh, disagreed a bit with the researchers who are also wondering why there's not that much lichen anymore. So he said that this is the, This is the reason what he thinks. No, minä sitten tuonne seitsemänteen kysymykseen. No, no Sami Arpeviiros tietuus hummojuo ja challojuo na joulu. Muhtin tutki, että tätsi ehti tätä falla chadda, että hilä. No, muhta talle, muhti mä lohke, että tälle, tämä on vähän nuko, tälle nuohkuun, että arvi, että muhta lea, 
i mahtu kela kasi tetsä. Era fastatsi, että tätä saa rohta huua ja jätä hohpuu semmas kohpaa sammikia, kulttuura ja eelauhusa ja johtaa luontuussa. Mä ei tonu aiviltä, mihin elää saami arvevilosti ehto. Mä kaltaako lefaarus, kun valta ei ole manna miltä. Mä kaltaako te vaikka tuolla. Tällä tavalla kylläkin neitä tehdään ja parni samma farus. Että neitä maanalle lihkapuri paraka pohtuu kuin parni maana. Mutta ei ole vaan, kun kyllä valti maana ei melte. Ja muusko ne lihkuu monen maailman heijamiin valtaan aallon maana ei melte. Ja aallon muistella, mihin luontuus tahpahua ja millä luontuus... Mokkalaka varjeli lonttuu. Mi ei hoitso pääsikin valti helliin muoras. Tano puulen munotsona, te hiotsamana tuohtari. Ja te kun mi puolekin, kun just mis laapuille leomasan, mikä alkaa raine tämän paikki. Eikä otso lihkalla, te kerkki, saa kerkki toppe. Täällä ei mis merrausta. Jos tuolle lihkallaan tehdään valtaan kerkki, toka tolvuus semmassa, että se ei rohto. Takar ohpulen otson. Tiedänsä tulokon. Joo, otatko kysymyksiä? Yeah, so the question is, uh, there's a lot of uh, talk and writing about uh, Sami traditional knowledge. And some researchers say that it just gets created. And others say it's about anticipation. Uh, the others say that you live... Uh, in it, you, you, you learn it uh, by, by learning the language, culture, uh, livelihoods, and, and uh, moving in the nature, being in the nature. And what's your opinion? Mm. No, Antti Oula tässä sanoo, että kun on tässä lapsuudesta asti mukana tuossa porohoidossa ja, ja ottaa omat lapset siihen mukaan, että no, erityisesti korosti sitä, että tyttölapset ovat yhtä tärkeitä kuin poikalapset, ja, ja, ja he ovat ainakin oman vaimonsa kanssa ottaneet mukana lapset jo ihan pienestä asti mukaan tuohon poronhoitoon. Ja sitten se opetus sitten luonnosta, että ei siltä saa oikeastaan mitään ottaa, että ei tuottakaan ottaa puista. Ja, ja sitten kun on siellä paikassa, on laavustellut ja, ja, ja tulistellut, niin kaikki pitää sitten sen jälkeen puhdistaa ja kaikki ne... Kivetkin, mitä on liikutellut, niin ne pitää pysyä, pysyä sitä paikassa. We'll see how it goes with my translation. Um, so basically, Antiola uh, explained how he has been raised with this reindeer herding from the from the young child, and he he wanted to say that it's important that all the children are brought into here. So he he mentioned, for instance, that. And together with his wife, they have brought their children into reindeer herding from very young onwards. He also mentioned especially that also that the girls uh, are included. So it's not excluding the, the female from the herding. Uh, then in addition to this herding culture, it's also about learning how to, how to be in the nature. So uh, he, he mentioned how we... I would say how we uh, shouldn't take anything away from nature and and for instance if we stay in there we need to clean up the place as we would do at home so you shouldn't take um, anything from there with you for instance from the trees or or even the the rocks in there should be remained in the in the nature. No, <laughs> Ohta kajalta kamun jeeran talta nyt lohpa sitten, että täällä vähän jo vähän tatsia ja vähän takkaan kehpausta kanssa piukkaan. Joka monta lohpa. Ja alkes kajalta. Ja riftes vastaus on, että jos ihkarit nopeil palkasivat. No onko? Manjelaakin mi sahti pissähi talkkata reuta ja mohon mi vuokaitua jo tahpaan ja pohtimassa nuppastusa ja täyttä arktalaiskoulussa. No niin, kalleikin hopa vaattis kajalta. Mohte... Kun me ajattelemme tässä tuolla maailmaa, ohta hekkiä, mikä alkaa säästiä tämän 
kohtevas vuoda olot muille. Aattelä oppaa tiivuksa, teitte mannan repui. Kun me ajattelimme huotsin toi soodine pisaani. Te me soittelimme, ajattelimme hoktavuoda radallami. Ja tänne te me päässä houhtas, houhta meille. Ajattelin, tulkoon mun tätä ja lohpaa saani. Okay, so this uh, is the final and an and easy question <laughs> that you could get a Nobel Prize for, for answering this. So how can we stop the climate change and how can we adapt to the changes that have <laughs> already <laughs> occurred <laughs> and will occur? me <laughs> 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 Yeah. World is not so bad as we think it is. Mutta katse meillä pitää olla tulevaisuuteen. But we have to look into the future. Me teilläkin lapset ja lasten lapset jaksais pääsistellä tässä hienossa maapallossa. So that your children and grandchildren could also live in this beautiful world. Sen varmasti toivomme kaikki sydämellä ihan että elämä jatkuu maailmassa. Ja jokainen opettaa tulevia nuoriakin, että älkää tuhoutko maailma. So that's something we all can wish from the bottom of our heart and that we all uh, teach for younger people. Yeah. Hey, yo, lo, le, la, lo, 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 le, 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 lo, le, la, le, la, le, la, le, la, lo, 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 la. Olu kiihtu. Paljon kiitoksia. Kiitoksia. This, uh, this Sami uh, language. Uh, perhaps uh, 4,000. So 4,000 4, people speak this language. Yeah. Okay. Can we give them another round of applause, please? Wow. This was very fantastic, and it's priceless. It's difficult to get people such as Yuko. See, so we, I mean, we are blessed to have such person, isn't it? It's, 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 people who have the, the real knowledge of indigenous. So, Clement, you want to say something? Uh, I have my presentation. Is the later or now? Aha, uh -huh, okay. So you do it now, then I'll ask you a question, then we, 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 okay. Okay. So we listen to him, then we continue his questions. Okay. Uh, the central challenge, as we discussed with Antiola, is lack of understanding. The protection, protect, protection of traditional knowledge is for its part a sensitive issue. The reason is that traditional knowledge is related to indigenous rights. It also provokes con confrontation, especially in Finland. Finns have profiled themselves as nature people, and many feel that the Sami have no more knowledge than Finns have on nature. This way of thinking has slowed down the protection of traditional knowledge in Finland. One central, also global challenge is, is that traditional knowledge is not definite. It's uh, easy not to protect something that is, is not definite. In Finland, there are 
two acts where Sami traditional knowledge are mentioned and also generally defined. These are Genetic Resource, Resource Act and Climate Act. They are also the main legal instruments to protect traditional knowledge. In, some, in Finland, Sami traditional knowledge is applied in practice practice mainly in the work of Metsähallitus in implementation of Akvekokun guidelines. Metsähallitus, Sami Parliament and Skolt Sami Village Assembly have an agreement on how to implement the guidelines. A specific Akvekun working group is established to support the land use and resource planning. It has only holders of traditional knowledge as members. As we discussed with Antiola, traditional knowledge has always developed and traditions and knowledge have been lost and new knowledge has emerged. But traditionally the change has been rather slow. Now the change is rapid. Climate and the environmental conditions change so fast that Sami have only little time adapting to these changes. It's a question of balance. What are the limits for adaptation are? How much cultural knowledge can be lost without losing the Sami cultural goal? No, no one can deny that Climate mitigation adaptation are vital, and action must be done now. I'm concerned that in the adaptation and mitigation process below, sight of the uniqueness of, of all mankind, which is culture and cultural heritage. That is what the global community should be able to solve. In other words, how can we preserve our unique cultural heritage heritage and cultural richness in the future. So, what, so that the whole world does not become a unified culture, or is only survival enough. This is something that we need to discuss also in, in some climate change. Traditional knowledge protection is challenging. In Finland, it requires support of traditional Sami livelihoods reindeer herding, fishing, hunting, and Sami handicrafts. Traditional knowledge does not survive in books and archives, but working in nature. Easiest way to support Sami traditional knowledge would be to support the Sami livelihoods and cultural traditions related to them. But it seems to be pretty challenging, at least in Finland. Another easy way would to be incorporate some traditional knowledge and tradition to get to education and early childhood education and care. But once again, it seems to be quite difficult to implement. Finnish education system is focused on education in Sami language and overlooks cultural knowledge linked to the language. Language is not only communication, but it has cultural knowledge that can only be fully understood in the right context. This means knowing the phenomenon in its correct terms and knowing how to act accordingly. Finally, I would like to finish the same way I started. I asked Antiola how is the kuohtun? which means the pastor, must pastor and nutrition condition of reindeer in the winter. Why is the important knowledge? It is an, of core, it is one of core knowledge system of reindeer, some traditional knowledge. Kuohtun is an umbrella term that in, in, in the Sami language can be divided Oh, no, that's the right picture. Uh, 
Kohtun is an umbrella term that it's in the Sami language can be divided into 20 different categories based on the quality and access accessibility of snow and the nutrition. There are about 570 terms in North Sami describing snow and ice. Kuhtun. Many of the terms are not used anymore because conditions have changed. If you lose a word, you also lose the skill needed to in identify the condition. So, what we can learn about traditional knowledge and kuohtun, and why it's still important to ask about kuohtun. First, it's a tradition, one reindeer herder ident identifies another reindeer herder. By asking about kuohtun and listening to the answer, we also know it if knowledge of kuohtun is relevant to the reindeer herder. If the reindeer are fed in the enclosures, the kuohtun does not matter. So by asking and answering, we know about the reindeer herding model. And by asking and answering, we learn on the tradition and, the, and are the traditions alive. Research has suggested that knowledge of kuohtun varies in reindeer Sami culture nowadays, and its importance varies regionally. That the deterioration of kuohtun identification know-how is one indirect effect on climate change adaptation. And the last, hey, oh, is, where is, yes, yes. Uh, some traditional knowledge is concept used in research literatures as well, but it, it's mainly used as an um, umbrella concept without defining what it means. The values, views, and understanding of climate change held by the holders of traditional Sami knowledge are necessarily tied to science-based knowledge and solutions. The know-how of the holder of traditional knowledge is transported into theory, theory through the collection of in-depth ethnographic material and, and its understanding. In other words, theory is constructed in interaction with the compli compilation of ethnographic material. So, to sum, sum up, Finland has a lot, lot, lot to do. Sami traditional knowledge has formal protection, but not in practi practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Clement. And um, our time was, is advanced, but um, we all acknowledge that this area is not much audited, area related to indigenous knowledge. So I think this is a wake up call for all of, all of us as we go back to start thinking the line of uh, indigenous knowledge. So we have less than 10 minutes. So maybe I should um, ask uh, Kripsan. Uh, you have heard the presentation. And how does this discussion look from the size perspective, uh, in the size perspective? How, what we can act in relation to this in the context of the Thailand, uh, side of Thailand. Thank you, Michael. So, um, from my point of view, I will tell you something that might be different from what you have heard here. So. My first point, so in the context of Thailand, we recognize uh, the indigenous people as a local community, but according to the convention, there is a two technical term, like indigenous people and local community, but in Thailand, we recognize them as a local community because according to 
our constitution, everyone are equal before the law. So they have the right to do everything that the citizen of, of Thailand can, can do. So, and the big challenge for, for them, we know that we, they play the important role for uh, natural resource conservation and preservation, but the biggest challenge for them, I th in my perspective, is the uh, bureaucracy or the political system, because in Thailand, most of the case, the uh, environmental policy is top-down approach. So even they have their own the right of the election, so they can elect their own uh, local government. So, but the decentralization is is not it inappropriate there. So we need to be decentralization. So in both in terms of political authority and also financial support. In, for example, like uh, we do have, actually we do have uh, the policy about all the, the regulation about the community forest. So, but actually the community forest is already exist before we have an act about the community forest and so they, the com local community, they have their own way of living. So they are harmonized, how they know how to, to utilize the natural resource in a balanced and uh, sustainable use. So, and I also have do some research and I found that some article already include, uh, include that, uh, conclude that so the traditional community forest is more effective than the management of the government who have the responsible to take care of the like for example the national national park or something like that so because uh how, how i think the most important thing for the community forest it, to bring is more successful is about the trust and they believe in what they do. So it's not a property they see is like a heritage. So the natural resource is heritage. It's not property, but from the perspective of the government, it's a, like a property. And then the policy forced them to, like, you should help us to protect. Actually, we can, they, I mean, the government and the community or indigenous people can work together in order to, to protect, to conserve and preserve the natural resource. So we, from my perspective, it is, is need to be something that we have to do. Like uh, we need more bottom-up approach. So government should include the indigenous people or local community and bring them into the discussion because it's not possible to to use the uh, one size fits all policy. So it should be some tailor made policy in because in different part of the country they face the different challenge. So you cannot apply the same thing with everyone. So. Thank you. Let, let us give him a round of applause, please. Okay. In connection to this, I would ask. I would want to ask um, Professor Stamler in connection to auditing. So, how, how can we, in our auditing, how can we approach this more holistically with that, with a view of what you said in your presentation? so that we also bring it into our audit. That's a very difficult question, am I? <laughs> because I'm not an auditing expert. I, I <laughs> okay, great. Um, but, but I would guess the, the real challenge is there the, um, 
leaving behind this hierarchical view of how the world is organized that we usually come up with. Because as we heard also from uh, um, from Clement and, and, and Antti, um, this, these indigenous ways of knowings, they are context sensitive and they are and they're basically, they base on the idea that all beings in the environment are equal, humans and animals and the spirits and, um, and, and, and the plants and the lichen, as we heard, and so on. And they all can have a soul. How do we incorporate in that into auditing? I think when, I would imagine when companies, for example, enter these areas, one way of, uh, of checking how they do um, in these terms is to to what extent um, are indigenous views being heard um, in industrial projects, for example. Um, and I would st I would strongly emphasize that this does not it it's not enough to do um, what is called FPIC, free prior and informed consent. But I think it should really be this full project life cycle integrated participation of um, of indigenous knowledge holders and I would also uh, subscribe to to the view that was just expressed that this does not have to be only um, people with um, with uh, with with indigenous background that's not enough it's actually people who who have connection to the land um, because as we heard this knowledge these ways of knowings are experience based um, so it's it's not enough that we that, that you have someone who lives in New York City in the 21st floor and has an indigenous background um, because this knowledge is alive um, and when let's say a, a wind farming company comes to a reindeer pasture area they they need to be talking to the people who know that land from their day-to-day -day activity and there must be ways in auditing to incorporate that and one way is maybe of, of doing that is uh, to partner to partner with researchers and the indigenous inhabitants of these areas um, to to check how the companies are doing in this respect okay wow okay thank you so much for for very good uh, Answer. Uh, maybe um, one question to maybe Clement. Um, I just want to know. In short, I would just want to know um, Finland. To what extent Finland has been addressed issues of um, traditional knowledge in relation to in relation to the biological diversity convention if you covered a little bit in your slides but if you can put the emphasis on that in finland finland uh, in in the group of hj aquacon they implement uh, this H A and 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 the uh, C B D okay. articles, and and uh, uh, the, the this work has uh, um, started about uh, uh, ten year, fifteen years ago, in, in with uh, uh, some parliament and its hallitus and and. Uh, uh, called Sami assembly. Okay, so okay, thank you. Let us clap for him. Yeah. So time, time is not is not being our best friend. We have Olivia online waiting for your questions. We have Slido as well. Maybe I ask uh, Vivi if we have some. Yeah, from the Slido, one question to all of you. So, like, like, uh, what did you choke uh, about? Like yoik, this yoik, do you say it yoik in English? Uh, that's the traditional uh, Sami way of singing, and you did did some singing. So what was it about? <laughs> yeah, yoikuhan on... Kuuluuko se? Yoikuhan pannaan paljon ihmisiä, kun sinulle kivivii saattaisin panna joiku. Ja minulla on oma joiku. Ja sitten... 
se tehdään poroillekin joiku, sitten tehdään koirille joiku. Ja se on sillä, kun ihminen on hyvässä fiilingissä, niin kuin yleensä laulajatkin. Niitä löytää sanoja ja joikuja. Ja joikuja otetaan kävelytyylistä. Tämmöinen, joka hiljaa kävelee, sillä on hittaampi joiku. Sitten, joka oikein niillä on, niin sillä on nopeampi joiku. Tulkaapa se. Oh, it might be that I'm not able to translate it as beautifully. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's this joik, like uh, you can make it from a person, you can make it uh, for, a, for a reindeer, you can make it for a dog, or you can, you, you can make it about basically anything. But the point is, like, if you have a very good feeling, like, then you, then you, uh, it just comes, comes out, yeah. Meillä on yksi tunturi jo sitä joikaa. Se on nimeltään haltitunturi. Varmasti tulee paha keli. Jos minä jonkun ihmisen haluaa, että se jäisi minun tyköön. Silloin nuorempana muistin, kun oli naisia, niin pahuella joikasin sitä, tätä haltitunturia. No pakkohan niillä oli jäi. Sitten ne rukkoilit, joika taas se hyvä halti. Ja niin, täytyy sitten, kun oli jo kyllästynyt, menkää pois. Me voin. So, uh, there is a, a high mountain in Finland, it's called Halti. And there is a joik for Halti as well. And then Antti was trying to describe, like, um, back in the days when he, he was younger and uh, when... <laughs> okay, thank you. This this is a this is a joint effort. I'm Johanna Ikavalko from the Arctic Center trying to do this. Uh, so if you are uh, if you are singing a yoik to this halti fiel, it means that you you want to have you want you you wish something bad to happen to something or somebody. So then sometimes if, if there were like not that nice ladies around uh, when he was younger, he would be then singing a joik for this halti. If you, if you wish to have a bad weather, he will now start singing a joik for halti. So don't raise your hand, please. <laughs> We have had it enough wet, bad weather. Ei näytä nousevan käsiä. Eikö ole vähän semmoinen surullinen sitten yhdestä kohdasta? Kiitos. Yeah. So this mark the end of our... I don't know if we have a question for Olivia. So this mark of the end of our uh, session on indigenous knowledge. We would wish to continue, but we have other uh, things in our agenda. So give us a round of applause, all of us, as we go down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it.